with globalization, the places that thrive were places like in the United States that you probably all have heard of Silicon Valley, this place around San Francisco. You go to San Francisco, you see a lot of things. You see a lot of traffic. You see a lot of people. You don't see a lot of manufacturing plants. You don't see people going into factories to produce, to work on assembly lines to produce steel or automobiles. They're producing types of services, products that are based on ideas. I mean, think about Google, which is really one of the great, um, I guess, innovations of your generation. Right? Uh, where did this come from? Two young people, uh, roughly the age of, of those of you, I guess, who are first year students, they were coming out of Stanford and they create this thing, right, called Google. What's that really based on? It's not certainly not based on factories and plants and people doing roots and ice work. It's based on ideas. And so it was for entire regions, entire cities or regions. Places that thrived with globalization were based less on what we call physical capital, factories, machines. That had driven the whole post-war Wirtschaftswunder. If you could master physical capital, you had growth, you had jobs. But there was a shift now to, to knowledge, to ideas. It wasn't just in the United States. You could see places, Geneva, Switzerland, was doing uh, quite well. Increasingly, Munich, uh, which is a surprise, really, of your parents' generation. Um, uh, in the, um, after World War II, Munich just seemed to be a, a nice agricultural, uh, I know from uh, Dr. Grimm is from uh, the Munich region. I don't want to insult her. her, her <laughs> Just go ahead. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly what I recall uh, from Munich was, it was a nice, what they say, Lederhose und Bier, right? That's what Munich was. And it still is, but there's a lot more. Uh, uh, it was massive transformation. It was based on roughly people working, not with their, we say in English, their bra on their backs going into to factories. Uh, I worked in a factory. You worked a long time ago. Uh, 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 it was hard work. But now you have to work with your, your ideas. And that was the strategy Munich used, most successful places. So that public policy started to shift. How do you work, how do you help society thrive, deal with the problems when the driving force of society is factories, machines? There's positive, there's negative things to a society that's based on we call knowledge or ideas. It was clear what becomes important is exactly what you're doing here. You're investing in human capital. That's what we say in the professional business. Economists say, oh, investing in human capital. Well, that means you're learning. You're learning how to think. You're learning how to make decisions. You're learning how to judge decisions, uh, judge situations. You're learning how to make judgments. Those are not things that you can routinize and outsource and offshore to other countries. You need to, you need to uh, uh, be in a context of around other, other people, other decision makers. That's what we mean by knowledge, creativity. Well, armed with these kind of modern theories, uh, a few years ago, maybe about five, six years ago, I was called up to a meeting in Stockholm. Stockholm, like the rest of Western Europe, certainly like Germany, certainly like France, uh, the Netherlands, uh, had suffered really stagnation, escalating unemployment in the 1990s. Things were kind of dismal. And the Swedes were used to being one of the richest, wealthiest, just very affluent countries, societies in the post-war era. And they felt like they were losing. So they called a little meeting with people and asked, well, how do we get it back? Armed with these theories of the new economy, the knowledge economy, I remember I marched into Stockholm seven, eight years ago and told the, the, our host, the minister of, um, of, of industry and economy, very kind host, just like our host tonight, and said, oh, the answer is obvious. What you need to do is to invest in knowledge. You need to invest in research and development. You need to invest in patents. You need to invest in, in human capital, better schools, better training, and so on. And I remember he said very kindly, well, we're sure, Professor Aldrich, you must be right with all these titles and jobs you have. Uh, uh, but nobody will believe you because by all the measures, 
Sweden's already number one. Look at R&D, R&D per capita. Look at patents, patents per GDP. Look at the levels of the, the, of the educational levels, the human capital levels. They're either number one, number two, number three. They were having the investments of knowledge, especially if you start considering knowledge more broadly. Think about creativity. Think about people who are tolerant, people who are traveled. I would never want to argue the Swedes are the, the top in the world, but most of us coming from America are, are very impressed with Europeans. They're clearly traveled, they're tolerant, they speak different languages. All of this contributes to creativity, the investments in culture, the cultural traditions. These seem to be the right kinds of policies that you need for a knowledge economy. Well, it was that day that I first heard the word, the Swedish paradox. And what that meant was the Swedes seemed to have the right public policy approach that all the experts would suggest, but the growth wasn't happening. This impressed the uh, president of the European Commission at that time, Romano Prodi, now he's president of, uh, of Italy, so much that he and his colleagues adapted the term for what they called the European paradox. They seemed to have the, you know, generate high human capital, cultured people, trained people, people socially sensitive, people travel, people speaking different languages, fantastic research. Sure, some place a little better, some place a little worse. Great education. Um, all of these investments, of course, cost a lot of money, but the return was not, it wasn't missing, but the return wasn't big enough to give people, society, what it wanted. What does society want? What almost societies always want. It wants to be able to, to create a, a good lifestyle, a uh, sus environmentally sustainable uh, kind of lifestyle. And this seemed to be falling short, not just in Sweden, uh, but throughout the European Union. This was, the, this was what was called the, um, the uh, European uh, paradox. What was causing this European paradox, this Swedish paradox? Well, it seemed to be the assumption made by policymakers, by public policy, that investment in research, investment in education, human capital, and in knowledge, culture, that alone is going to pay off. It's going to create what society needs, growth, jobs, competitiveness. In a global economy where everything that's standardized, routinized, <coughs> tends to be outsourced and offshore. So that over time, if society didn't change and grow, or if it didn't change, more and more jobs would be lost as a result of globalization. Well, the assumption that those investments uh, 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 alone suffice, there was an error in that logic, which is what we call, or I call in the book, um, the knowledge filter. And that says just because there's an investment in knowledge or in research, or in education, or human capital, it's automatically going to get out in society. And there's lots of examples where that doesn't happen. You can see examples in the, in the public sector, um, or in the, the university sector, certainly from research. But you can see examples in the, in the private sector. Um, if I think of the great firm IBM, um, uh, IBM,